Okay, well, um, good evening, everybody. Uh, I'm Congressman Jim Himes, um, and I want to welcome everybody to this um, panel discussion, this Zoom panel, uh, the topic of which is oversight. Um, obviously, a very, very important uh, subject uh, today with an executive that is um, sort of gleefully um, antagonistic to the concept of oversight. Um, and of course, when I say oversight, we're talking about the use of American taxpayer dollars. We're talking about complying with the law. We're talking about complying with the separation of powers and respecting uh, the various branches in government. Uh, I am so thrilled to be joined tonight by just some of the uh, best people I know uh, on the topic, truly sort of global experts on, on this issue. Um, first, I'm joined by uh, my colleague, Jamie Raskin, uh, who is a congressman from Maryland's 8th Congressional District, um, sits on the Judiciary Committee, and in virtue of his seat on the Judiciary Committee, obviously had a very um, specific role in the impeachment of President Trump, in some ways akin to the role that I was able to play uh, in the investigation leading up to that on the Intelligence Committee. Uh, Jamie is also just in for the bargain, uh, a longtime constitutional law professor, so he's going to give us a um, perspective on where the concept of oversight uh, comes from and how important it really is. Uh, and um, he also is one of the members of the Bipartisan House Select Committee on the Coronavirus, uh, a really essential committee because the coronavirus response the CARES Act and other associated legislation um, has been the largest appropriation that the United States Congress has ever made uh, at once, uh, in excess of $3 trillion. And of course, making sure that money is used wisely um, is essential, and oversight is all about that. Uh, we are also joined by Walter Shaw, um, who, as I said, is uh, one of the leading experts on government ethics, um, having served as director of the US Office of Government Ethics from 2013 to 2017. Uh, during his time as director, uh, Walter led an executive branch, and you know, that was inside the executive branch, a uh, wide ethics program that uh, involved um, 4,500 agency ethics officials um, supporting, obviously, the workforce uh, for the federal government in the millions. Um, he is one of, I think, uh, the most interesting, certainly on social media, uh, commenters uh, on the depredations that we see every single day. Uh, out of this administration. Uh, and before I turn it over to Walter, um, let me just give you my perspective. Uh, when I say that this is a unique moment, um, think about what the executive, what President Trump uh, has done uh, just, just in the last year. Uh, the broad and unapologetic firing of inspector generals, and by unapologetic, I mean um, there are two reasons given. One, I have the power to fire an inspector general, which of course is not really in dispute, um, but there's, it's also a barely veiled um, attempt to get rid of people who could or who did provide uh, oversight um, to the executive. Um, when we were doing our investigation in the Intelligence Committee on the uh, Ukraine events, which ultimately led to the president's impeachment, time and time again, the White House demanded that not just their employees, but their alumni defy congressional subpoenas. Um, and it's important that people understand there's always been a tension between the executive and the legislature. The presidents have never enjoyed the notion that Congress can call uh, anybody they want in front of uh, a committee uh, and question them. But, but that's been a, an issue of friction. We've never seen absolute refusal, the blank denial of subpoena authority um, that we have seen from this administration. And perhaps just as concerning, again, thinking about this from the standpoint of Congress, one of Congress's most important powers is the power of the purse strings. We, through legislation, determine how taxpayer money is spent. And in that arena, too, the president has blatantly disregarded that concept by declaring emergencies that allow him purportedly to take money that the Congress said would go to, for example, military construction of bases, of, of, of all sorts of things that were fairly in a detailed way determined by the appropriations bills and spend it on building his wall. Um, and again, that really strikes at the heart of one of Congress's most powerful authorities. And so this raises all sorts of questions, one of which I pose to my Republican colleagues all the time, which is, you know there will be a Democratic president someday, uh, and you will want to conduct oversight just as you did uh, to the Obama administration, and just as you would have had Hillary Clinton become president, conducted uh, oversight there. So the precedent you're setting now 
uh, is catastrophic for the separation of powers and to good government. Um, before I turn it over to Walter, um, I want to share with you, though it will not be the topic of this evening's discussion, um, a unique aspect of the oversight role I have as a member of the House Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence. Um, I've outlined a number of things, the spending of money, the division of authorities. Um, in some senses, the oversight of our intelligence apparatus is one of the most sensitive and important things that we do. Why do I say that? Because it is a massive apparatus, roughly $80 billion a year in spending, and it does, by definition, dangerous, sometimes lethal, certainly uh, operating on the margins of constitutional authority, on the margins of legal authority, and it does this in secret. And so there are a very small number of legislators who are asked to review on a regular basis the lethal activities which the intelligence community undertakes in your name um, and the other things that the intelligence community does in secret uh, in order to make sure that the existence of secret spend and secret activities in democracy can be reconciled. Uh, and again, we worry as, um, as members of that committee that, uh, that the president may disregard uh, our um, oversight responsibilities in that realm as much as he does in any other realm. And now you're into a world of, as I said, uh, possibly extra constitutional, possibly extra legal activity um, in a realm in which enterprising reporters that ordinarily would look at government spending that was not secret can't see. So the importance of oversight is something that I feel, and the, while, while most Americans may not feel that importance uh, as much unless they're thinking about the activity of the intelligence community, I feel every single day what some of the possible downsides are should we continue with the blatant disregard of oversight authority that the Trump administration has shown. So with that to give a, um, before we go to Jamie, um, let me uh, turn it over to Walter to give um, a, a brief introduction on uh, how he sees things today and in particular from the standpoint of executive self oversight. So thank you. Um, you know, this assault President Trump has done on the constitutional oversight mechanism of Congress isn't happening in a vacuum. This has been an across the board challenge to accountability that he's waged since day one. And in fact, before day one, because it began with the ethics program. Uh, and while I was leading the Office of Government Ethics, we were working with his team beginning the day after the election. So from my perspective, the Trump administration really began November 9th, 2016. Um, and right from the start, there was the decision that he was not going to divest his conflicting financial interests, and he completely undermined the ethics program. He's also resisted transparency mechanisms like the Freedom of Information Act. He has, you mentioned the intelligence community. He's been replacing people in the intelligence community, shrinking the staffs closest to him, and pushing out career, career experts to have fewer people to keep an eye on him. He's retaliated against whistleblowers and called for others to do the same. And one of the most recent battles he's begun is a fight against the inspectors general. I think it's worth looking back to where they came from. I mean, we've had some form of inspector general since the beginning of the Republic in the army and they served different roles over different times. But it was really in the wake of Watergate that the current Inspector General program create, uh, was created. 1978 was a watershed moment when the efforts in the legislative branch to pass legislative reforms came to fruition. And you had a reform of the civil service through the Civil Service Reform Act that created a merit system of federal employees that were insulated from political influences so that they could carry out the work of government objectively and not for political patrons. And you had the Office of Government Ethics created and other mechanisms. But in the same month that they created the Office of Government Ethics, which I led, they created the Inspector General community to ensure that the people would have a set of eyes inside the major agencies. And over the years, the Inspector General community has grown. We've now got about 14,000 people working for Inspectors General in the executive branch, saving us billions of dollars every year by rooting out corruption and, uh, or errors. They also search for safety issues that can directly impact the public. They just today released a report 
of a review of dangerous conditions that led to a veteran dying in a veterans hospital. These are people who are in there protecting our interests in every respect. And in 2008, Congress passed a law to give them a little more insulation, a little more independence from the president by saying the president needed to give 30 days notice before he could fire somebody. And the idea was that the public blowback and congressional outrage would be such that uh, the president would have to back off of it and Congress could stop it. Unfortunately, after the impeachment, President Trump now knows that he's got protectors in the Senate who will make sure that he doesn't pay the ultimate price for anything he does. And once you take that off the table, it becomes very hard. Um, so he's been acting with impunity in removing these inspectors general, and it's removing a critical anti-corruption mechanism that protects us. He's now either fired or replaced five inspectors general, and in every single case, uh, he has been motivated by something that inspector general did to protect the public against corruption in his administration. Uh, so these aren't, this isn't even a general philosophical disagreement that he thinks inspectors general should be appointed by him. He specifically wants lap dogs installed where uh, previously watchdogs were, were keeping an eye on the government. I'll give one final example. He has been nominating people who he considers loyal to these positions. And one of the worst, most egregious recent cases is that he's nominated a White House lawyer to be the special inspector general for a segment of the coronavirus bailout. And this particular individual has some good credentials, but most recently while he was serving in the administration, he helped the White House stonewall the legislative branch and engage in the blanket resistance to oversight that the Congressman just mentioned in the introduction. So I think we're entering really dangerous territory where one of the final barricades between the American people and just rampaging corruption in the executive branch is being kicked down and unfortunately it's succeeding. Is, is it my turn, Jim? <laughs> On that bad note. <laughs> well, sorry, um, uh, thank you very much for that. And um, so we need to come back to um, what was a little unsaid in the picture you painted there, which is, so we know we have at least six months more, uh, eight months, I should say, of this administration what could happen? And of course, we need to come back to how do we get back to a place uh, that is not rock bottom? We'll come to that. But, uh, but uh, in the meantime, let's hear, let's hear from uh, uh, Congressman Raskin. Thank you, Congressman Jim Himes. It's a, such a pleasure and honor to be with you. As you know, I'm a, a huge fan of your work in Congress. And I think you're just an amazing, remarkable champion of the public interest and of integrity in government. And also, you're a great representative of the people of the 4th District of Connecticut, which uh, includes a number of my relatives, including my mother-in-law, probably going to be watching right now. You're uh, welcome back anytime, Jamie. <laughs> so, um, I, uh, and I'm delighted to be with Walter Schaub, too, who really is our preeminent and foremost uh, enterprising champion of um, public integrity in government. I mean, he is the one who's been there both on the office of government uh, ethics side, but also um, as, uh, you know, as a, as a critic and uh, an outside watchdog too. So delighted to be with you guys. Um, so I wanted to um, start by um, first uh, uh, confronting a few myths, which I think concealed the truth of what we're really talking about when we're talking about oversight. And then I know um, people are interested to hear a little about what's going on with the new select subcommittee on the coronavirus. So, but, you know, I guess the argument that I would want to make, Jim, is that um, the attack on oversight is an attack on representative democracy itself. There is no representative democracy without the thing we call oversight. And oversight can seem kind of abstract and technical, but it's actually integral and inextricable from the work of legislation. And so uh, for me, it all goes back to the first three beautiful words of the Constitution, we the people. Um, you know, the, our preamble to Constitution is one sentence, we the people in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure, uh, in, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the government, 
promote the general welfare, um, and preserve to ourselves and our posterity the blessings of liberty to hereby ordain and establish. Okay, we can't do any of those things. We can't provide for the common defense or promote the general welfare or ensure justice or establish domestic tranquility if um, we can't figure out what's going on in government, if we can't figure out what's going on in the country. And the Supreme Court has repeatedly identified the oversight function or what's been called the investigative function, um, the educational function of Congress as integral and essential to what we're doing. How can you legislate if you can't get the information that you need? So James Madison said something that's beautiful, which is that those who mean to be their own governors must arm themselves with the power that knowledge gives. If you don't have the knowledge, you're not gonna have the power you need to, to govern yourself. So that's really what's at stake. And you look back over um, American history and uh, the history of Congress, the oversight function um, has been absolutely critical to uh, democratic governance. I mean, you saw it in the Teapot Dome scandal, you saw it in the Watergate scandal, you saw it in Iran-Contra, um, and you've seen it on all sides of the spectrum. You saw it in Benghazi, which I think was ultimately a kind of failed and fruitless political investigation, but nonetheless, it was an expression of uh, where Congress was. And uh, as I reminded uh, Mr. Jordan, they had 10 committees investigating Benghazi. He was upset because uh, on his counting, the new coronavirus select subcommittee is the eighth uh, committee that could have jurisdiction over the trillions of dollars we're spending and what's going on with the corona crisis. I reminded him that in Benghazi, um, there were 10. He was on the 10th committee and uh, Benghazi dealt with the tragic loss of four Americans. We've now lost uh, over 100,000 Americans um, in this case. But in any event, um, oversight has been critical and, and integral and both parties have uh, pushed it and have defended it, um, at least when they're a majority, if not on a more principled basis. Okay, um, so the, President Trump um, has categorically ordered non-cooperation with the legislative branch, with Congress. Um, that's an absolute defeat for the constitutional design of our democracy. And here I wanna challenge the myth that Congress is a co-equal branch. Sometimes people will concede that and say, well, Congress is a co-equal branch. Congress is not a co-equal branch, or if it is, it is the first among equals. You know, the, the preamble leads right into article one. The, the very first sentence after the preamble is all legislative power is reserved to the Congress of the United States. The sovereign power of the people to create the constitution and the country flowed right into Congress itself. And then you get this amazing enumeration of all the powers of Congress to regulate commerce domestically and internationally, to regulate copyright, to regulate the district that's to become the seat of government, to declare war, to uh, ratify treaties, to pass legislation and to override a presidential veto by two thirds, to impeach a president for treason, bribery, and other high crimes and misdemeanors to impeach other uh, civil officers of the United States. Um, and on and on and on, all of these powers are in Congress and including Article 1, Section 8, Clause 18, which says, and all other powers necessary and proper to the execution of the foregoing powers, okay? Then you get to Article 2, which is short for, four short sections, okay? Um, the, and the fourth section is all about how you impeach a president, okay? So there's three sections that describe the powers of the president and what are they? Well, essentially to be the commander in chief um, and uh, of the army and the Navy and the state militias in times of actual insurrection. And then beyond that, the core duty is to take care that the laws are faithfully executed. Well, if the president's not faithfully executing the laws, then the, pre the, the Congress has the remedy of impeachment, which makes very clear the order of relationship. Congress has the power to impeach the president. He doesn't have the power to impeach us. The framers set it up like that for a, a very compelling reason, which is they wanted 
government by the people. And they distrusted um, the power of one and a president becoming a monarch. So we need oversight for legislative purposes because we can't legislate on anything from farmland to defense to intelligence, as you know, to public health and disease control if we can't get the information. Um, two, preventing a president from becoming a king. And that's a constitutional mandate. Beginning, you could start with Article 1, Section 9, Clause 8, the Emoluments Clause, which says that the president, and neither the president nor Congress, can accept a present and emolument, which means a payment, an office, or a title of any kind, whatever, says the Constitution, from a prince, a king, or a foreign state. Now, why, why would that be in there if the founders of the Constitution did not want us to enforce that command and to determine exactly what the president was up to while he's in office. I mean, America is a great country. There are a lot of things you can do with your life and you can go out and make money in a lot of ways. You don't have to be president of the United States, but if you become president, the emoluments clause dictates that we must have access to your finances to make sure that you're not being compromised by foreign entanglements. And the exact same thing with the domestic emoluments clause, which says that the president is limited to a fixed salary while he's in office, which can be neither increased nor decreased by Congress and may receive no other emoluments from the federal government. Well, every time they go down to Mar-a-Lago for the weekend, they spend at least $100,000, $150,000 to pay for the Secret Service and for the Department of Defense and the Executive Office of the President to stay there and drive around on the golf carts and pay for the rooms and so on. That's just, you know, that's just one kind of expense. So we have the constitutional, not just the right, not just the power, but the duty to be enforcing the constitutional command against the president um, becoming a monarch. All right, so finally, let me just close with a word about our new committee, Jim. I view it as having three duties, and one has to do with the present, and one has to do with the future, and one has to do with the past. The present is there are trillions of dollars of the people's money being spent on a daily basis to try to manage the staggering economic, budgetary, and fiscal crisis caused by this pandemic, okay? And some of it is going out through the 3P program. Some of it's going out through unemployment insurance. A half a trillion dollars is going out through the Treasury and the Fed to directly to industries and different sectors, and then there are hundreds of billions of dollars more that are going out in other methods to states and federal departments and count local governments and you name it. Um, we've got to guarantee that the money is not being siphoned off for self-dealing and political corruption. And I'm sure Walter Schaub has dozens of examples already, but one of them has come to light recently, I think just yesterday maybe, or the, the day before, where um, President Trump's Deputy Chief of Staff, Zach Fuentes, uh, resigned from the White House and uh, 10 days later was given a $3 million contract to provide um, personal protective equipment to hospitals in Navajo country. Um, and so never having been in this business before, never being in medical equipment or supplies, he leaves the White House. He throws up this you know, overnight get rich quick scheme business um, for, uh, for a million masks and gowns and stuff. And apparently more than 25% of the equipment that's been delivered already is completely unusable. So, I mean, there'd be huge problems if he actually delivered what he said he was gonna deliver, but in the course of things, no, he gets this sweetheart contract uh, on a, you know, no bid basis for millions of dollars right when he leaves office and then the people don't get them on. So those are the kinds of things that we're gonna to have to do. One, then in terms of the future, America does not have a plan, does not have a strategy to get out of this nightmare. And we have not from the beginning. And the virus is spiraling out of control in lots of states right now. In certain states like New York, it's been brought under control, but we're gonna be succumbing to recurring bouts of relapses of, um, outbreaks and shutdowns if we don't have a national plan. The, the federal government should not be pitting the states against each other for a bitter competition for supplies and for ventilators and so on. 
It should be coordinating the logistics of this. It should be mobilizing the industrial sector to be creating the stuff that we need and making sure that everybody's got it. So we've got to try to work on a real plan quickly to be done with it. And then finally, we got to look at the past. That is, how did we get into this? Now, our GOP colleagues have been demanding as recently as today that we make this an investigation into how China suppressed the truth about the coronavirus and that there's been a conspiracy in the Chinese government to impose this on America. Now, I'm totally open to our getting into what the Chinese Communist Party did in suppressing the first scientists who tried to blow the whistle and so on. All of that should be part of the story, along with the way that the President of the United States collaborated with them. And in Fe January, February, March, as recently as the beginning of April, said that the Chinese government was doing a great job. It was all under control. The Communist Party has got this. And of course, we had nothing to worry about and everybody could go on with their business and so on. It would all be gone tomorrow. It would be gone uh, by Easter. It would be gone by April 1st and so on. So I'm not, uh, I'm not in any sense avoiding that, but we've got an immediate crisis with the money and with coming up with a real plan to get America out of this nightmare. So, uh, you know, the GOP wants to say, we're not interested in how this started. We're very interested in how it started and we're very willing to name names and to identify what happened. I think ultimately we could, it could lead to a 9-11 commission style report on how this happened. So it never happens to the American people again. But right now we've got other priorities that are of a more urgent nature. I yield back to you. <laughs> Thank you, Jamie. Um, Jamie, before we get in, there's some specifics we need to talk about, um, but um, there's a question that is just burning from what you said. You use the word power um, in association with Article One in the Congress about a dozen times. Um, and I think you're absolutely right about it. You're the constitutional law professor. Um, legally speaking, constitutional power, uh, as you point out, resides with the Congress. But there's that wonderful and maybe apocryphal story because um, what is that power in reality? And there's a wonderful apocryphal story about Winston Churchill is talking to, to, to Joseph Stalin about the Tehran conference. And Winston Churchill says the Pope has an interest in this. And Stalin looks at Churchill and says, how many divisions does the Pope have? Power at the end of the day, um, it, you know, it involves something other than a piece of paper. And I want Walter and you, uh, um, to reflect on the fact that we don't have a police force, we don't have the military, we don't have power in the traditional sense of the word, it's paper power, if you will. Um, and therefore, we turn to the other branch of government, which we have not talked about this evening, the judiciary, to enforce our decisions and our power. And there's all sorts of problems associated with that that we see every single day. The, you know, the time it would take to get the courts to enforce subpoena, to come up with a contempt uh, um, a decision, uh, to agree to require the president to turn over his tax returns. Walter, let's start with you because we haven't been back to you, but, but let's see, I, I want to hear from both of you for a minute or two about what the nature of congressional power is if our sole recourse is a lengthy uh, judicial process. Well, I think that's absolutely the issue. Since 2017, when the Office of Government Ethics was first under attack, America's been getting a real civics lesson in the difference between authority and power. <clears throat> authority being the thing that the paper says you can do, the written laws, and the power is the ability to execute it. Um, you talk about the, the difficulties dealing with the courts. The Congress issued a subpoena to Don McGahn, the president's former counsel to the president, in April 2019, I believe. And now 13 months later, it's still winding through the courts. It just had a rehearing on Bonk in the D.C. Circuit. It'll be a while till they issue decisions, and then there'll be an appeal to the Supreme Court. So you might finally get a decision next year. And then McGahn may show up if you hold a hearing and he may start refusing to answer to some questions and you go through litigation for several more years. So unfortunately, we have the courts, but the courts are moving too slow. Uh, some have raised questions like Dahlia Lithwick has raised a question as to whether they could be moving faster and they're choosing not to. But whether that's the case or not, they're not moving fast. And that leaves you now facing the practical realities I know some people have 
um, in the public have been asking, well, why aren't they using inherent contempt to arrest people? I just can't even imagine how badly it would go if the sergeant at arms and thus the janitor staked out the State Department and tried to go up against the diplomatic security force with their machine guns as Gus is wielding a mop at them. Uh, it just would be a hopeless case. And so there's, there's a factor of reality that really comes to play here. Um, the same thing with inspectors general, just as I encountered with the Office of Government Ethics. They have the power to report. They don't have the power to issue um, decisions saying this action shall be taken. And even if they could, uh, you have the example of the president's own appointee to an agency called the Office of Special Counsel, which is not related to Mueller. It's a standalone agency that enforces the Hatch Act, a law that prohibits misusing an official position to influence an election. And this Trump appointee who came from a conservative watchdog group with serious conservative credentials, he used to work for Chairman Jason Chaffetz, the Republican who used to lead the Oversight Committee. Um, so this is an individual with solid Republican and conservative credentials. And when he recommended that the president fire Kellyanne Conway for repeated flagrant violations of the Hatch Act, the president's counsel, uh, Pat Cipollone, wrote him a letter accusing him of being a partisan and unfairly going after Trump, and then announced that they simply weren't going to do anything about it. So in some ways, it almost feels like it's very important to have legislative reforms. We need them. We need to set up structures that will prevent things from happening again. But we also have to be realistic that in the near term, the laws that are on the books can't always be enforced and, and have their own limits. I think one of the key things members of Congress and others can do is building off something Congressman Raskin said, knowledge is power. The more people can get access to information, the more the public can make decisions about what they're going to tolerate. And uh, that may take one form or another, but I think the very best service people can provide to the public is provide them information when other enforcement mechanisms break down. And then, Jim, here, here's what I did. Do we, do we, in fact, have any real power? Well, I think we do. Um, power, of course, belongs to those who exercise it, you know? And um, so you're right. We, we cannot count on the courts. And if you haven't already, it's time to fall out of love with the Supreme Court of the United States. It is not our friend here. And uh, we've been experiencing uh, months and years of right-wing court packing in the federal courts. So, you know, we've got two cases in there right now, uh, the Mazars case and the Deutsche Bank case, which are about the most elementary, simple forms of congressional discovery that are just essential to the legislative process. And they're acting like it's uh, you know a Rubik's cube, like it's some big complexity, and it's not. So I'm hoping for the best there, but we're prepared for the worst. So what are the powers we have? Well, we haven't talked about our most um, critical power, um, the one which led James Madison to say that the Congress is the predominant branch of government, the power of the purse, the spending power. They can't spend anything without us. Now, um, we are in a situation of divided government as you know. So the Democrats control the House and the Republicans control the Senate. So there is a limit to what we are actually able to accomplish deploying the power of the purse. If we had um, Democratic controlled uh, House and Senate, we'd be in a very different situation in terms of the way we would be able to use the power of the purse to say, oh, really, you don't want to come and testify before Congress? Well, then obviously you've got way too many staff members if you're too busy to be doing that. And, you know, we can, there are lots of things we can do to tighten the screws on the executive branch of government using the power of the So that's number one. But, but Jamie, let me cut in here for a second because I'm yeah. not sure it's simple. Um, and the reason I say I'm not sure it's that simple is because there was bipartisan, bicameral opposition to taking money that the Congress of the United States allocated to defense construction and using it to build its wall. Um, and uh, in the end, we didn't obviously have the two thirds required to, to override a veto of the legislation would have turned that around. But again, even the power of the purse uh, would appear to be not what we would hope it might be. That's an excellent point. And, and that particular issue has to do with power that Congress has given away 
by setting up a whole series of national emergency right, status right. that Our give fault. the president the power to act and redirect money, uh, requiring uh, Congress essentially have passed by two thirds in concurrent majorities in order to do what it should be able to do, constitutionally speaking, by simple majorities in both houses. So the, look, your point is absolutely correct there. And it's true with respect to war powers. It's true with respect to spending. The emergency powers is a great example where Congress has given a lot of power away to the executive over the decades. And I think if nothing else, the Trump administration has proven to Congress how dangerous that is. You might be assuming that everything is going to be hunky-dory with the president. And so, oh, why not say the president can just declare an emergency and begin to reprogram money? Now we see what that's given us in terms of, you know, billions of dollars wasted on a right. stupid medieval, uh, you know, desert wall um, that's a vanity project for the president. So I agree with you there. Um, there there's a lot of excavating we've got to do in terms of the federal statutes, because we've given so much power away. But again, I come back to my point. That power, if we're willing to exercise it, if we're willing to fight for it, we can get back. We must get it back, because the alternative is precisely what the framers of the country didn't want and what the American people have always fought against, which, which is monarchy, dictatorship, centralized power in one person. It's not good for anybody. And you might think it's good for you today, but it's not going to be tomorrow. And that's why representative government is the best where we've got hundreds of people who come together and it is you know an awkward and difficult process to get everybody there and to make sure we're operating and everything but it's the only way that we're going to really allow the people of america to be represented and to yeah. speak and, and we've got to do the oversight it's up yeah let me let me let me switch tracks a little bit because we've probably got less than 20 minutes um at, 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 you know fascinating question uh, and clearly the Congress has homework to do because we have, Jamie, as you point out, given away an immense amount of our authority and power uh, over the years. Um, okay, something we haven't talked about that I, I, I wanna touch on. Um, clearly the system, this gets to you know, the point we were talking about is that we don't have a police force, we don't have a military. Clearly the system relied, or well, yeah, relied, I'm sorry to be using the past tense, on a certain level of respect and deference to each other as, uh, um, co-equal, although Jamie, as you point out, we are Article One. Uh, it, the system really relied on the observance of norms and the maintenance of respect. And of course, this president has obliterated that concept. So that raises two sort of interesting issues. If you watch how the uh, norms that used to obtain in the United States Senate of deference to each other have been obliterated over time, and let's be fair about this, it's been, been done by both parties, um, it is very hard to go back uh, in fact, I can't think of a lot of examples of government going back to the observance, the voluntary observance of norms and respect. So there's two ways to look at this. If we do get a Democratic president next around, maybe out of the goodness of his, uh, his I guess I guess it's going to be his, it's going to be a Democratic president, Hart, um, uh, mm -hmm. the president will choose to go back to those norms. But I'm not sure that there's any reason to believe that that would be the case. That's question number one. And if that's not the case, if this is, in fact, sort of Machiavellian and bare knuckles, as it appears to be. Do we need to get into the process of, of, of converting a lot of traditional norms to actual rules and regulations? Well, Walter, what do, you, what, what do you think? Well, I think, as I said before, if you go the route of trying to create rules and regulations, you've got to have some kind of teeth that can be deployed when the executive is unwilling to deploy them. That may include finding creative ways to give private parties standing to sue when certain laws are not um, honored. Uh, right now, the biggest challenge most outside groups face is an inability to get standing to even challenge a law uh, or non-compliance mm -hmm. law. Um, another thing would be to look for ways to create um, independent objective overseers who are not in the executive branch. And that may no longer be possible with some of the court decisions that have come down. As you say, the Supreme Court has been a friend of the president and not a friend of the people over the years. But if something like the prior uh, Independent Counsel Act can be revived where courts are appointing individuals and the president can't fire them, I'm not sure that that's still going to work with current precedents, but if it can, that would be another mechanism. And I think a third thing you can look at, which would work for both norms and laws, 
is to find some way to create enforceable means of disclosure because we have seen that in some cases where the public gets a hold of information, the public pressure can stop a thing. And that was vividly displayed when Trump talked about holding the G7 conference at his Doral resort and the public just about took to the streets with pitchforks and he had to back off. He didn't back off because he agreed it was a bad idea. Uh, some of his allies in the Senate finally realized that they could be in danger if they didn't put a stop to this, and that came from the public. Um, so along those lines, you've got to get the public information. And right now, we don't know very much about Trump's conflicts of interest. And I say this as somebody who signed off on his financial disclosure report because it complied with the law, uh, or at least as far as we know, he subsequently learned it didn't uh, with, with the hidden Stormy Daniels payment. But um, the law doesn't require disclosure of his business's uh, liabilities and his business deals and his partners. And I think um, that's something to look at. And I also think that there ought to be a law prohibiting a president from having conflicts of interest. They shouldn't be allowed to retain these. And I know some have raised constitutional objections uh, based on the idea that that might be construed as a qualification to be a president, which the Constitution doesn't allow. But I don't think it would prevent anyone from being president, particularly if it came with alternate penalties, such as a, a series of increasing fines calculated as a percentage of the undivested assets with a statute of limitations long enough, like 10 years, that the next administration could actually enforce it and the president would have to comply because they couldn't be sure the next president wouldn't come in and take all of their, their wealth from them. So I think um, looking for mechanisms that are enforceable either by the public or by something that's independent of the president and creating more disclosure and resolving presidential conflicts of interest goes a long way toward getting at some of the underlying problems. Because I, I think there are some in the administration, like Bill Barr, who are just naturally authoritarians. I tend to suspect that Trump's authoritarianism comes from a desire to pursue his corruption and kick down any barriers in his way. But I don't think he has any particular ideology for or against authoritarianism unlike somebody like Barr. And so I think if you eliminate conflicts of interest, you eliminate one significant motivator for some of the things that we've seen, uh, which is why I think the original sin of this administration was his retention of his conflicting assets. Mm -hmm. Jamie, any thoughts? Well, first of all, I agree so strongly with Walter's point. The original sin of the administration was to refuse to divest himself of all his business interests or even put in a blind trust, but um, that was that was a radical break from uh, prior practice, and it essentially proclaimed that the president was going to continue to engage in business while in office, and he has, and he's converted the presidency into an instrument of self-enrichment, uh, which has trampled basic constitutional norms and uh, basic constitutional boundaries and set a terrible precedent throughout the executive branch, and we're paying the price for that right now. But, you know, as to your, your point, um, Jim, let's see, I mean, two things I wanted to say. One about norms, you know, one norm, for example, was that the president doesn't interfere in specific criminal cases in the Department of Justice, okay? And I mean, that was really cherished. If you can think back before Donald Trump, you, people just would have thought it's unbelievable if the president started trying to dictate, you know, settlements in cases and who gets prosecuted and dropping cases. Now, we consider that just, you know, the, the, the daily paper, looking at, the, you know, the president interfering in everything going on in the Department of Justice and then installing um, a completely um, obsequious functionary um, flunky, you know, to, to run his political business as the attorney general. Uh, I mean, that's a, a remarkable change. I don't know how you legislate to stop that. Um, the, the, what they pushed to the max was this unitary executive idea, which is, well, if it's in the executive branch, then the president is like a dictator. And, you know, as Trump has said, then, then there's this Article 2, which allows me to do whatever I want. Um, that idea, of course, obliterates the civil service. There's no civil service protection. Everybody serves at his pleasure. Everybody, you know, on the Securities and Exchange Commission and the Federal Trade Commission, everybody just works for Donald Trump. Um, I think 
that there's a very powerful constitutional refutation of that, which we've got to make. And then we've got to try to uh, rebuild those norms. But the one thing I would say is it's important not to overly romanticize the past. I mean, you look at what took place in Marbury versus Madison, that was a really brutal, gloves off, bare knuckle partisan fight. And you look at the presidential election in 1800 uh, between, uh, between Jefferson uh, and Adams, the same, same thing. I mean, you know, so we've been through periods like this before, but what's changed is that um, now we have one political party which identifies itself not with its branch of government, not with Congress, but with a president because he belongs to that party. And so we've got a partisanship rung amok. You know, the, the Federalist Papers were all about how people who served in government would identify with their branch. So members of Congress would be jealous of our power of oversight. And now we've got our GOP colleagues who were very zealous about oversight when Obama was president, who now side with the president in trashing all of our subpoenas and our requests for information. So, I mean, it's a really remarkable change that we've seen right now. And it, it's gonna be a long walk home to try to rebuild these basic constitutional norms at a time when you know, the president today is attacking the First Amendment rights of you know, Twitter and Facebook. He doesn't think that they have a First Amendment right to even stand up for the truth, which is a really an extraordinary turn of events. So, so let's, um, because I think we have about uh, uh, less than 10 minutes, um, I have a, a, a small question and a, a big, almost existential question. The small question, um, we don't hear quite so much about it as we used to, but illustrating norms and also illustrating um, the slowness of the judiciary is the question of the, of the president's tax returns. Um, it had always been a norm uh, that presidential candidates would release their tax returns. This president said no. Uh, that put Congress in a difficult position initially, right? Because there was no law that said the Congress had that the, that the president needed to make that disclosure. Even though Jamie, you you make a very powerful uh, emoluments uh, argument in terms of understanding what the president's uh, uh, commercial interests commercial interests are. So you had that a norm that was just flagrantly violated in ways that probably damaged our ability to understand the conflicts. And then, of course, Congress issued its subpoena, and that's in the court. So. That's the small question. Uh, where does that go? And, and is that an area where we need to actually enforce uh, or create a law that says presidents will fully disclose, including their tax returns, um, before they can qualify to run? Well, whether that withstand constitutional scrutiny. I, I would, um, yeah, I would agree with the point that the president should have to turn over uh, his or her tax returns if they're asked for by Congress, just under the authority of the Monuments Clause alone, which makes certain that the president is neither converting the presidency into a for-profit enterprise with foreign powers or else looting the taxpayers, um, that seems to be a constitutional obligation. Now, I would have no problem routinizing that and requesting it. I think you do get into a Qualifications Clause problem if you say they've got to be turned over um, as a condition for being on a ballot someplace. But once you're elected, you've got to turn them over. And if not, a whole series of consequences could flow out of that. Uh, we, you know, we've got to make sure that this presidency doesn't become a precedent for people running for presidency of the United States in order to make money, mm -hmm. you know, either to elude their creditors, to stay out of jail, or, and then to build their corporate empire by having you know, their children be running the business or other family members running their business. That goes back to monarchical forms of government that, that we sought to overthrow, that the American Revolution targeted. So I, you know, I hope that in the Mazars case, which is what you're talking about, Jim, I hope that the uh, Supreme Court does the right thing and the obvious thing and says, of course, the president's got to turn it over. Congress has asked for it under a, a duly passed statute, which was clearly not passed to uh, harass the president. Um, he, you know, the president uses the phrase presidential harassment, which I think is a very dangerous road for him to go down given the 16 existing lawsuits against him right now by women. Um, but the, um, the court should just do the right thing. And I think that will help us to calm this area of the law and help us to reestablish those basic norms. You know, the uh, constitutionality of financial disclosure has been upheld, at least for the president's appointees. And 
presidents don't file financial disclosure reports out of the goodness of their own heart. One option is to start adding questions to the financial disclosure requirements in the Ethics and Government Act that go beyond the current requirements. We already have a two-tier system where members of Congress and the top layer of government have to provide some information in their financial disclosure report that lower level officials don't have to provide. Mm -hmm. uh, ever since the 2012 Stock Act, they have to include mortgage information on their personal residence, which other people don't have to disclose. So there's already a precedent for a two-tier disclosure system. Uh, you could go even further than a tax return and get some information that um, tax returns won't provide you, such as list all of the liabilities of any businesses in which you or your family combined can have a controlling interest. Um, and that's information you wouldn't necessarily get from a tax return. So, so one option to look at would also be expanding the financial disclosure requirements for the very top level of government. Okay, last question. We've, um, this has been a terrific conversation. Um, uh, it, has, uh, it has been it's really important, maybe a little dry. So I have to close with the sort of um, Hollywood movie question. And I know that Jamie and I both uh, get this question every single day. Uh, and it's, it's sort of the ultimate oversight question. It's the constitutionally existential question. Um, in the election of 2016, Donald Trump, before it occurred and after it occurred even, with the, uh, the, this notion that there were millions of illegal uh, votes, uh, uh, set out to delegitimize the credibility of the election that he ultimately won. Uh, not a popular vote, but he won the Electoral College, which is how we elect presidents. We already see the president doing that now, suggesting every day that the system is rigged, that mail-in voting will lead to fraud. We see the basis being set for, if he loses, him declaring that the election was illegitimate. So I know that's a little bit Hollywood-esque, but let's, let's, let's close on an exciting note. Um, what is the probability that that occurs? And if it does occur, what is the remedy? Well, I, th I think anything's possible with this man, and it's very scary to already see him laying the groundwork. Um, it's almost like the old movie Seven Days in May, except in reverse, because it's the president plotting a coup instead of the military. Um, but I, I think the most important thing we have to hope and pray for, and, and there's a reason it exists, is that we have a professional civil service and a professional military and every last member of both has pledged allegiance to the constitution and has sworn to defend it against enemies domestic foreign and domestic and i hope that what will happen is if he says i'm not leaving and i reject these he'll just be one little man screaming into the wind as the secret service escorts him off the white house grounds uh, because if that doesn't happen the alternative is horrifying yeah that's tough that's baby <laughs> well <clears throat> um let's see the first thing i want to say is that we are really in danger of becoming a failed state a failed state is one which cannot deliver basic security to the population against disease, against gun violence. Um, a failed state is one where you don't have um, uh, political elites and leadership that are committed to the common good and the public interest, but are rather committed to their own self-enrichment and converting the government into an instrument of their own wealth. Um, and a failed state is one where elections are routinely corrupted and the will of the people is diverted. So you raise a profound point. Um, and in fact, you, you, know, you don't have to do much more than open up the newspaper to see uh, the president's growing attacks on mail-in balloting. Nobody ever knew that that was something controversial or sinister before. Certainly the president didn't know it when he voted uh, absentee in New York for many years and started and then started voting absentee immediately in Florida without having <laughs> moved his belongings down there. Um, look, you know, the absentee voting is part of American electoral culture. And there are a number of states where, um, like Oregon, where everything is done by mail. There's nothing wrong with it, but the, except that the president perceives it as being against his political interests. So I'm very 
very nervous about what's going to happen in this election. And I'll tell you one scenario that's really been keeping me up, Jim. Um, the, the president and his party thrive on the weaknesses in democracy. You know, Roosevelt said that there, there are no problems in democracy that more democracy won't solve. And I believe that, you know, in my heart. I believe it with every fiber of my being. And I still go back to the fact that Hillary Clinton got three and a half million votes more than Trump did. His was a victory. He squeaked out a narrow victory with the assistance clearly of Vladimir Putin um, in the Electoral College. Um, and it was, not a, it was not a popular victory. So his party has been thriving on uh, the Electoral College, on the gerrymandering of congressional districts, which they have defended strongly when we tried to legislate in HR1 to get rid of them with independent redistricting commissions in every state and union. Um, they thrive on Citizens United and large, uh, undisclosed, dark money corporate spending in our elections. All of these are imperfections in our democracy, just like the disenfranchisement and exclusion of 700,000 Americans who live in Washington, D.C., who are the residents of the only capital city on earth who are not represented in their own national parliament. And the people in Puerto Rico, three and a half million uh, disenfranchised, who saw the price of that when Hurricane Maria came, and so on. All of these um, are a democracy deficit. And the president's been thriving on them. And here's the one that really scares me for 2020. Uh, the president, as everyone knows, is a great fabulist. He makes things up and he can invent controversies brilliantly out of thin air. What, so look at the swing states where Republicans control the state legislature, but public opinion has moved dramatically against the president and now for Joe Biden. So look at Wisconsin, look at North Carolina, uh, look at Michigan, okay? Look at the places where Republicans control the legislature and watch out for them um, manufacturing little controversies. You know, they can show up, you know, as they did in, uh, in 2000 at the Palm, Palm Beach County board canvassers with, a, remember it was a, the Gucci riot. And they said, you know, something bad is going on in there. And then what they'll do is what they were threatening to do in the 2000 election. They'll say, well, it's too confusing here. It does look like Biden's way ahead in the popular vote in Michigan and North Carolina, but something happened and we don't like it. And uh, the mail-in ballot and somebody put their stamp on the wrong way or something. They'll say the legislature should just exercise its normal powers under article two of the constitution to appoint the electors for whichever presidential candidate they want. They'll, they'll try to revert the whole thing to the state legislature, just appointing presidential electors for Trump. Um, and we've got to blow the whistle on that and every other scenario we can think of right now. So we're prepared for it. And just like we've got to get the whole country ready to go and vote to reclaim our democracy, we've got to get the whole country ready to go and defend the vote and defend the electoral democracy we have. And then when the election's over, we've got to go and rectify all of the weaknesses in democracy that allowed this to happen to us. Um, great answers. Um, I, I, I think I have the way we close this out, because I think um, uh, Walter talked about uh, the civil service. Uh, Jamie, you, I think, gave a very good sense of what to look out for. We haven't talked about what I actually think may be the most important thing should that eventuality come through, which is public sentiment. Uh, Jamie, you've heard this because the speaker says this every single day. Public sentiment is everything. Without it, nothing can fail, or with it, nothing can fail. Without it, nothing can succeed. Um, I think we've already seen that. The march in Washington the day after the inauguration was such a demonstration of an alternative um, to the vision that the president was propagating at the time the popular uh, uh, uprising associated with the defense of the Affordable Care Act, uh, I believe saved the Affordable Care Act. I think it made just enough difference. And so in addition to the civil service, in addition to any, whatever we may have to do in the Congress, should that happen, um, people need to be ready uh, to defend their own democracy, um, to stand up uh, against the notion that we will be a failed state and that we will continue to be uh, an exemplar democracy. So, um, boy, with that, I, 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 I feel so privileged to have been able to participate on this with uh, you guys. I'm an amateur, you guys are professionals at this. 
Um, but I hope that this will um, be valuable to a lot of people. And I suspect we have a pretty good audience. So I did want to close on that point of public sentiment, because I think at the end of the day, that's going to be uh, the essential thing. Um, it is now eight o'clock. Uh, I am very, very grateful for both of you uh, participating. Um, and uh, uh, it is uh, an honor to serve with you, Jamie. You brought an immense amount of intelligence and thoughtfulness to, uh, uh, to the United States Congress. And Walter, all of us uh, look regularly uh, at what you say and the decision and the, and the things that you uh, uh, put out there. Um, and, uh, and, and so I really appreciate the role you've played. So thank you, everybody. Thank you, Jim. Thanks.